So welcome everyone to the Read to Lead author, Meet the Author series. So this session is with Bruce Daisley, um, author of Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat and The Joy of Work. Um, I'm Sarah, the founder of Read to Lead. I'm all about connecting people through learning together. We use brilliant books um, such as Bruce's, uh, powerful conversations um, to ultimately become better leaders in life and business. Uh, we've got a global community and we also work with corporate teams to inspire curious minds and collaborative cultures. Uh, so that's a bit about me and us. Um, Bruce, I'm going to have a go at you. Um, so you're a writer, consultant, uh, one of the most, uh, the UK's most influential voices on the intersection of work, of work and life. You've done a lot of research. I've read some of your papers. You've been featured in uh, publications from uh, Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, The Telegraph, uh, your podcast. Really interesting, guys. Check that out. Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat is an Apple number one business podcast, best uh, best business podcast. Uh, you're ex-vice president of Twitter. So you've got that inside uh, behind the scenes experience of culture, which it would be interesting to hear a bit more about. Uh, you wrote The Joy of Work. Um so I think it's your first book, um, which is a Sunday Times bestseller, and you wrote Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat, and recently, recently, Fortitude. That's the same book. It's worth it's worth pointing out. If oh, is it? Haven't bought them. Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat is the same book as oh. The Joy of Work. It's the American edition. The only right. difference is I took out a joke about E17. That <laughs> is the only difference between them. There's slightly fewer U's, and I took out they had no idea who E17 was. Yes. And while in many ways, there's a case to try and convert them. It just didn't feel like the forum to do it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant. Well, actually, we 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 looked them up. Uh, we looked at book summaries on Blinkist, and they did pull out for sort of very different points. They came across yeah, a few them, different yeah. books, but actually, okay. it's a summary of the same book. Then, okay, interesting. Okay, Thank you. Book. Uh, yeah, and Fortitude, brilliant, uh, great new book. So maybe we'll get you back and talk about that one because, um, yeah, I've recently read that one. It's um, going, uh, going down a storm. So thanks, Bruce. Anyway, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate your time and sharing your insight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Look, very happy to come along and, and chat to everyone. Um, I tend to put a lot of the stuff these days that I do in free stuff that I do. So in the podcast or in uh, my newsletter, which is... Um, which is called Make Work Better, and, and you sort of can, can find that by, just by searching, uh, just just by searching my name or Make Work Better, you'll find that. And I, I tend to put most of the stuff in there, really, because I guess the challenge for writing about work is that there's so much happening and so much evolving. It kind mm. of feels simultaneously like anything you might write is dated. And uh. secondly, like, like this most of the themes are actually far more enduring than we might imagine. So uh, most of the stuff I do is just, you know, I have a constant debate. Shall I, shall I write another book? Big question mm -hmm. in my head, do people really read books these days? Um, and I certainly know that the big pile of books I've got next to my bed is only getting bigger rather than, rather than smaller. And so, you know, so I just put most of the stuff I do in that free newsletter. Yeah. It's a really interesting point because actually um, Read to Lead is all about um, bite-sized learning and based on the fact that, yeah, people have books, pile of books beside their bed, never read them. So we often start with Blinkist and, you know, there's lots of those apps, isn't there, that condense them. And I think it's a great way to give you a summary that gets you into the book or refreshes on a book or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and then you use, I, I often find that people are using books more as a research, uh, research tool to mm -hmm. kind of go back and read bits and bobs uh, if they want the detail. Um, but actually, we had last month, we had um, uh, Daniel Priestley, who wrote Key Person of Influence. And and he said, actually, write a book because it doesn't really matter if anyone reads a book. It's a great promotional tool, isn't it? It's a great way of reaching your audience and getting that, getting out there and getting in front of people um, and driving them to your newsletters, et cetera. Um, anyway, moving on from that. So thank you. Um, I, I, that was actually one of my first questions was... Um, there's so much change, isn't there, all the time? I mean, these book wrote back in 2020, and there's been a lot of change since then because of the whole pandemic, obviously. You know, have you seen, so if you take those two books, would you say um, there's been, is it growing? Is it changing in any way? Um, obviously, remote working and global teams has, has increased significantly. Have you seen certain shifts and changes that you would put in the book now if you were to write it? 
Yeah, I think the, the big debate really is about how we use the office. And, and I guess work is built on these three sort of um, these big uh, edifices that we, we don't we didn't even notice were there till they weren't there. So, you know, the office calendars and, uh, and messages message systems and we only noticed that these were even like negotiable part of work when one of them wasn't there and we're like oh right you know it was for so long if one of your friends said they had a new job you wouldn't say how many days in the office and what hours and um and you wouldn't say where are you doing the work it'd just be wherever they were interviewed that was be where they turned up it was only when that wasn't the case that we realized oh right all of that was a variable that was we thought it was this immovable thing that was non-negotiable and it was a variable. And, and to me, that forces us to reflect on the other two immovable things, the way we use messages, the way we use meetings, because they're far more um, fluid than we, we might imagine. But I guess, you know, the big debate really is uh, for any of us is how can you build cohesive cultures? How can mm. you build that, um, that sort of dynamic connection, that buzz that good cultures have? How can you do it in different ways and you definitely can do it in different ways and i think the um the sort of the debate the challenge is how you set about trying to create that so i think that would be the consideration mm. i don't know if i'll write a book again i did a slides deck just before christmas i, I sort of put a slides deck out of, of research of thoughts and i got probably three times as many people who downloaded and looked at that as uh as read my last book so you know big, sort of mm. big volumes there so it sort of it makes you think. Well, look, if the objective really is just to reflect on things, to put a debate out, maybe I'll just put a free slide deck out to mm -hmm. uh, do things on on that. The mm. E seventeen joke. Um, someone uh, asked in the comments, "What was the E seventeen joke?" So the E seventeen joke. You're <laughs> going to be uh, a very weak joke, but it was. It said um, many artists uh, establish their name with their first album. It's the second album that establishes their reputation, and mm. then I listed. Uh, like Radiohead's second album and Kanye West's second album and Prince's second album or something like that, and then E17's second album. Now, it was clearly a gag because E17 wouldn't be regarded as one of the greatest albums of all time, except by me. So, uh, <laughs> it was, it Is that was your music weak. choice? Is that an insight into it, your... I just, I just love pop oh. music. But, okay. um, but the, uh, it was a weak gag and the Americans felt that it didn't really move the narrative on mm. They didn't land the point, didn't resonate with them. It, it, it was going to be too laboured to try and explain who E17 was. And so you're going they, to they use that in always, social media, Cam. <laughs> they, they don't always love um, uh, non-obvious gags. I say that mm. as someone who is married to an American. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, back on track from E17. So... Are you are you seeing and are you are you hearing and would you say that people are uh, more disconnected or or less cohesive um, as a result in you know in in the workplace as a result of changing work practices um, changing communications technology I would would you I'd say that know what everyone else thinks I'd love to I'd mm -hmm. love you know uh you know whether sort of yes or no whether people think culture feels slightly different um uh I'd, I'd love to sort of get a sense in the in the chat of what everyone else thinks broadly That's... I would say uh, should, we, should we see what... yeah go on forget what, what what do people think are you just a yes or no less cohesive uh more cohesive I guess What's the yes or no then? Yeah. Mm. I mean, Matt, you've just gone into a business now working um, as an MD of a business. So yeah, that's what you're seeing and experiencing. Mm. Less, yeah. Mm. Yeah, less cohesive. Yeah. yeah. Not by much. Here's, and here's the really interesting thing right now. So um, I guess, you know, if you were going to be... A traditionalist you'd you'd have this idea in your head that oh if we only went back to the way that things were then things would be the way that things were and things don't work like that the, i um broadly if you look at the data two-thirds of people two-thirds of chief chief execs believe that we're going to end up back in the office four or five days a week and 90 percent of workers say we don't want to go back to that and it's broadly because people have felt that they've got their life in more balance you know I've seen, I've been interested in 
at people's perspective, but I've seen the narrative about burnout has declined a little over the last couple of years. People feel like their life's in a bit more order. They feel like they feel less overwhelmed than they were pre-pandemic and, and definitely mid-pandemic. Uh, people are sort of saying that they are in a, <laughs> a slightly better equilibrium. Um, I saw a beautiful thing, actually, which, which was there's probably no one more accomplished in the world of television than a woman called Shonda Rhimes, who is responsible for TV like Bridgerton, but had to get away with murder, scandal, Grey's Anatomy, like this incredible showrunner producer in American TV. And she did this commencement speech, which where she said, every time you see me succeeding, it means I'm failing somewhere else. And mm -hmm. like, wow, this, this woman is like, you know, the most accomplished person. How on earth is she failing? And she said, every time you see me collecting an award, I wasn't at a parent evening. Every time you see me turning up for the last uh, recording of Sandra O oh on Grey's Anatomy, it's because I didn't go to my kids' mm. uh, kids school play. And she says, every time I'm succeeding in one thing, I'm failing somewhere else. But you can't see that. And mm. so she constantly felt like she was balancing these things and she was failing more than she was succeeding. What, what I loved about that is that, firstly, it illustrates that the challenges of getting this stuff right go to everyone, right? Ev everyone's sort of struggling, that thinking they're not getting things right. But what flexible working has allowed is for us to feel like I'm failing at a bit less. Right, that's why it's so popular. It's a bit, we're failing at a bit less. Now, the, then the second question is, the, the chat was filled with people saying their team feels less cohesive. And, and I guess the challenge for all of us is to say, well, do, do groups of people who don't see each other all the time feel less bonded not always you know not always you you it might you might meet your old school friends your old college friends people you go to sport with family you know you might have reunions with certain groups of people and you hit it off and it's back to what it was so it's not necessarily frequency of time together that matters and so i think it's an interesting challenge for us how can you build really strong cultures with slightly different ingredients and i think that's the challenge of the moment there's some lovely stuff actually that, that really sort of points the way. Um, if you look really deeply into like the Gallup Workforce Survey, the Gallup Global Work mm -hmm. Workforce Report, or, um, the, there's a couple of things that come out of it. The first one, you probably know this off, you, if, if you've heard me talk, you'll have heard it a million times, but the number one predictor of whether people are engaged with their job is whether they have a friend at work. And, you know, really interesting, it sort of feels really sort of soft and, you know, I, I was speaking to 500 teachers yesterday and the idea that you'd stand up and do a strategy for a school that we want teachers to have friends here, it seems seems really trivial, doesn't it? Like, but begs the question, have you made any new friends at work in the last two years, three years? And what is what is friendship? And what mm -hmm. I always say here, that one thing that helps me sort of navigate this, I, I there's some lovely work. I, I put this in fortitude, but it's by... um. Uh, trigger warning, I'm going to mention poetry. Um, it's by uh, an Irish poet called uh, David White. And he says, friendship is the privilege of having been granted the sight of another mm. and in return um, being uh, gifting someone. I, I've ruined the poetry. Anyway, but it's, it's all about being seen. Friendship mm. is about feeling like someone understands you. Mm. Feeling like you've got someone you can tell something about your life and they understand you. Why would that be a big predictor at work? We just sometimes want someone to moan to, someone to connect with. But the, so so that feeling seen by a friend is really important. But actually, if you look into that Gallup Workforce Survey stuff, um, when when you look at people who are engaged with their job, uh, people who say they've had direct feedback from their boss in the last week, 80% of them are engaged with their job. And that's being seen as well, isn't it? All mm -hmm. of work is about feeling seen. And I guess, you know, <laughs> the challenge at the moment is how can you make people feel seen? Maybe when they can't be literally seen all of the time. Well, the only way you can see them is by summoning them to yet another video call. And it just begs really interesting questions. I think about how we use our face-to-face -face time a bit differently. Can we, you know, whether we spend a day a week, a day a month, a day a year together, can we make sure that that time we spend together looks a bit different? Because what a lot of people tell me is they say, uh, my days in the office and one back-to-back -back video calls and actually the worst thing is there's nowhere in my office to do back-to-back -back video calls so i find a little corner and put a pair of 
headphones on and just try mm. and deal with the noise. But that's not going to get the best out of people. But unless you sort of set about designing what these things look like, um, you're not going to you're not going to get good outcomes. So I think you know the challenge at the moment is the the problems are slightly different, and we're trying to apply sort of uh, very gently evolved solutions to them. Really, mm. it's an interesting one, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, quality over quantity of interactions um, and friends as well, and mm. and actually whether it it forces that a bit more to reassess that. Um, there's yeah. some comments in here. People look saying when they are together, it's quite intense. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and that's the question, really. Have you designed those times that you're together? Have you thought about, mm. you know, um, trying to uh, think about what those days look like? You know, this, this, uh, there's some lovely research, actually, which goes into meeting free days. And, you know, like, I, I, I've, when I used to talk about meeting free days, a lot of organisations say, we tried it and it didn't work. And more people I've chatted to recently have said, we've tried meeting free days and actually we've evolved them, developing them, and they, they're getting better. But I'll, I'll share some research on it. Because I think just in the spirit of, of experimentation, um, it's just a really interesting one to try, actually. It's a really interesting one to experiment with. Now, you know, for me, the, really, the real interest for meeting free days is thinking about, do you have one of the days that you're in the office as a meeting free day? And I guess that that's the spirit of what the research says in this. I'll put the I'll put the research there. Um, there's two things I've put there. One, which is the the research deck I put out at the end of last year that's had sort of thank thousands you. of of, of um, downloads. And then the separate thing is that just research about meeting free days. What I love about it is just um it just starts a discussion and debate really about you know if things are a bit different if, if things don't feel the same. Have have we tried doing something different? Have we tried mm -hmm. an experiment to do things differently? You know, and I think if we took an equivalent of other industries that were having problems, you know, with supply chains or delivery, or if they didn't try things, to, if they hit a problem but then didn't try intentional different experiments, you'd probably say, well, it seems like this is an obvious solution staring in the face. What have you seen then that you've uh, from companies recently where they are getting people together? What are they doing then that's working well? Yes, someone uh, there says, I would never have loads of video calls if I was in the office. It's pointless. I try not to have many calls when I'm in the office. So mm. real. Absolutely. Unfortunately, not everyone is gifted that freedom. And I think but that's the, uh, that's the most critical thing. Look, what I've seen recently is when I used to mention to organisations about meeting free days, most of them said, it wouldn't work here. And actually, mm. when you look into organisations where it doesn't work, it's principally the senior leadership that don't respect it. Um, they need to get meeting in on Wednesday, and so they put a meeting in everyone's calendar, and they go just this one time. And what it does, it creates a norm. It creates yeah. it comes uh, top something. down, doesn't it? Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so, uh, but I have seen more re organisations recently that have been sticking to it. Um, what else? The, what else are they doing? What else are you seeing? Um. Yeah, the I think, you know, more organisations trying to, on the days that people in the office trying to coordinate those days, um, mm -hmm. that seems to have a big impact for team cohesion. Broadly, what you get is you get the organisations who are closer to an equilibrium right now where they say this is kind of working. Normally, they've got a couple of anchor days or three anchor days where they're in the office. Three might seem a lot depends on the scale of the organization i find the bigger the organization the more anchor days they kind of need mm. they, they say they need small organizations i meet a lot of people who say we go in the office once a week we go in the office twice a week we coordinate we 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 spend that time together and it works perfectly well so broadly it seems like the bigger the organization the more the more face to face time C certainly senior leaders are asking for um, yeah yeah, so, you know, a strong spirit of, of experimentation, I think, is probably the best thing right now. Mm, mm. And just going back to your point on burnout, because you said that, you, that you're seeing that, because I've been reading a lot of stuff and, and seeing it seems like it's increasing, certainly with businesses that I'm working with or people are reporting it. Um, 
because of that blurring the lines when you are working at home um sort of work ekes into the evening so what um what advice do you have for people that and what have you seen that's had the biggest impact on on combating burnout or, or kind of in fostering that that well-being? Yeah. Um, the, the stuff I saw uh, a couple of years ago, sort of when we were just we were still coming to terms with how this worked, the burnout figures I saw there were higher than what we're seeing now. Now that might be right, that might mm. be wrong. I'm I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. You, you never. There's no single authoritative source, so you have to mm. get sort of dipstick on this. But burnout levels seem to be a lower consideration now than they were before. Whether that's just because we've got more equilibrium. Broadly, the, the stats about hybrid working, working from home, is that on average, people save about an hour a day, 70 minutes a day, if they work from home. And so, you know, it's pretty- And then you quickly fill it with other stuff though, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it depends. It, based on the data, people work an extra 30 minutes, but then they get 40 minutes back for, the, for their own lives. So, you know, it, it tends to be something of a win-win. Um, and, you know, it's obviously considerably cheaper. The, the organisations that I've seen are struggling who have got office mandates and they ask people to come into the office and they say people come in, they spend all day on video calls. No one seems to notice whether they've come in or not. And they start thinking, what's the point of me going in? What What is the point of me going to sit and have really bad calls on the office wife? What's the point of me doing it? And you, you ben, end up with a sort of sense of disaffection. The organisations that seem to be getting it right are the ones where people recognise there's a reason why Tuesday looks different or Wednesday looks different and that's why they're there. But, you know, I don't think there's one size fits all. Um, and look, you know, the trend witnessed that CEO research. Um, the trend is a lot of a lot of senior leaders are asked for more office time. It's a really interesting conundrum actually. One thing that, you know, just in the technology space, the one thing that tech firms always used to struggle with is they say, how can I hire against, you know, the marquee brands in the space? Because they pay more, they're more exciting products. Why would anyone come and work here compared to there? And uh, what we're starting to see is actually these these now there is scope for people to for firms to differentiate their offering. I saw last week uh, Rockstar Games, the, the makers of GTA, you know, probably the the marquee entertainment product mm. in the world, have demanded a five day return to the office. Well, the biggest game of last year, Spider Man Two, um, was made fully remotely, and so mm. actually there's a really interesting conundrum where there's not one size fits all, and firms are able to differentiate their offer. But I think the, the critical thing for any organisation that is trying to do something a bit different is trying to articulate what their philosophy is, how they're trying to um, bring people into that ethos, that mindset. And I think, you know, that's a, the big challenge for leaders right now. It, it's never been harder for leaders to try and articulate all of the things that they're thinking about. Yeah. And that 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 is a, is a big point, is that... Um clarity and articulation and communication I mean it, regardless of whether you're in the office right or you're working remotely communication is a, a fundamental part of, of of a successful workplace and actually um communication continues to be a challenge regardless what what have you seen in businesses that you talk to um in your own experience where um they've been you know effective uh, improve yeah. you know it's effective at improving that communication that fosters that kind of look cohesive uh, environment. I think quite often you can see from where it goes wrong uh, a pointer mm. of what we're all failing at I, I worked with one organization I can't tell you how bad the thing I did with them was I did something with the firm before Christmas it's like it was one of those things when I walked back to the train station afterwards I felt like the biggest failure in the world it was like oh, the walk of shame back to the bought myself a croissant like just just throwing anything at feeling better. But um, because I'd been in, I'd been called in to deal with this organization's burnout issues. And uh, and they said, uh, I said, like, let's start off. Um, who has more than 20 hours a week of video calls? Who, and so the, a woman at the back said, I'm gonna stop you there. We all have 40 hours a week of video calls. Like, okay, 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 right. That's helpful. And uh, I said, right, well, let's, you know, think about what that's about and she said look I'm going to stop you 
we're not going to do any less than 40 hours a week of video calls. So, okay, okay. So we've got this burnout problem. We're not going to change anything. I guess you want a magician or a wizard because like it's, it's not going to go away. But the challenge is, is like, if you've got loads and loads of video calls, the truth is people can't pay attention to all of those calls. And so mm -hmm. unless you set about thinking, okay, what we're going to do is as an organization, we're going to try, could you halve the amount of time you spend on video calls? Could you get it down by a third? And look, you know, I've got personal experience with this. We, I, I, um, when I worked at Twitter, we, uh, we did organization very up and down. I wasn't fired by Elon Musk. I want to clarify. Um, <laughs> The Terrifying. organization was very uh, up and down. Um, mm. and, we, and we did in one year, very familiar thing. We did not one round of job cuts, but we did two round of job cuts. Um, and uh, and very difficult to get your culture back from that because if you do that, redundancy is you go do one lot and then leave it, but you can't do two lots because people trust goes. Anyway, um, and it really damaged the culture. And we, we saw a really consistent problem where... For a long time afterwards, our best people were quitting. And so, you know, there was a trust issue and we tried to change that. We tried to get that back. But we, I'd sit down with people in exit interviews and I'd say, can I ask you why you're leaving? And people would say, it's too intense here. I have, have so many hours of meetings, so many hours of, of, you know, meetings late into the day, sometimes in the evening because it's an international company. Um, all these messages, Slack messages, uh, emails I feel like I'm constantly failing and we thought okay it's really interesting cause if someone said to you in an interaction I have too many meetings here if you're a manager of like any tenure you go yeah nothing I can do about that nothing I can do. You, you, you sort of you shrug and you think okay I can't reduce the amount of meetings that's just kind of work work 2024 and we thought okay well the people who are leaving are the best people so Let's mm. try and change it. And so we just tried to set about thinking, could we look at least some obvious ways to reduce the amount of time people spend in meetings? You can reduce the number of meetings, you can reduce the length of meetings, you can reduce the amount of people you invite to meetings. Really interesting. Each has got a different component. You reduce the attendee list, and a lot of people get upset. You know, mm. uh, suddenly you're not going to that the Tuesday afternoon marketing meeting and you feel like mm. I'm gone. You're, you're demoting mm. me. You know, it's like we feel like meetings are associated with status and that's where you know some of the developing tools the the microsoft copilot which allows you mm. to get an ai summary of meetings or, or yeah. google has a similar one I, I don't think it's the finished we've got fred here yet, today but, yeah but i, I don't think fred it's finished article, but yeah but th these are sort of developing and you know could be a way for us to reduce the amount of time we spend in meetings but unless you sort of set about thinking we're going to reduce that admin that gravitational pull of work you'll never improve the culture you know mm. these things are directly related and they don't feel like culture because everyone associates culture with like the team feeling motivated and the team like having a laugh together and like great results and you've missed the fact that if you've just got all these the bureaucracy of work is dragging people down you can't create a, a energized the basic dynamic. foundations isn't it really right, and, then, right. and building on that from from fun um i also want to pick up on the point you said there around trust because you know if people are unhappy at work that kind of links in with you know open and it links in with open and honest conversations feeling like you're in a psychologically safe place there's a lot of conversations around that at the minute um that obviously yeah it, it is a is a massive impact what what you said, what you tried, you know, you needed to try to build that trust. What have you seen um, has worked or what have you seen that um, businesses have tried to to build trust? Because I think that's quite a complex. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, look, you know, it, it's fundamental, right? You know, um, you, trust, psychological safety, they're pretty much synonymous, aren't they? And, and if you yeah. can't trust organisations, it's really interesting, actually. Uh, it depends on the size of the organisation you're in, but there are a few things that really play a part. One of the things that, an uncomfortable conversation in big organizations one of the things that undermines trust is uh ceo pay gaps mm. uh, when you're ceo earns a massive amount more than everyone else strangely um or maybe maybe not strangely but um it it, it changes a sense of social identity we, we we don't think of them as 
like us. Mm. Yeah, we do, we don't think they're an embodiment of us. Mm. If you see, if your CEOs were earning a massive wedge, and you know got loads of shares, and you know it, it caused a really big see, like you wouldn't necessarily instantly ascribe that with trust, but it does play a big part in the research we see. I um, interviewed a, a guy last week. Um, the guy who wrote Power of Habit, a mm. guy called Charles Charles Duhigg, Dugan, and he yeah. wrote the new book about communication. Yeah. And interestingly, he says um, quickest way to build psychological safety in, in the sort of the evidence that he looked at is for people to feel listened to. Yeah. And that's really interesting because you know, I guess we ascribe listening with feeling passive. It's like as a leader, you wouldn't necessarily say, "All right, I need to." my six month plan is go out and listen to more people. It's not the natural way that a leader would think. It just feels like a passive thing or an active thing. Mm. But if you want to build psychological safety, listening to what people say and acting on it seems to be one of the most important things. So I chatted actually um, to a brilliant woman called Frances Fry, who's probably like one of the best culture coaches in the world. And she said, sometimes this stuff isn't difficult. When people tell you that this is a problem inside the organization, you change it. It's like, yeah. okay. Like she said, the, the biggest issue inside organizations is that those pulse surveys, those custom, th those employee feedback things that people say, you know, this person, is, this practice is toxic or we don't like this. And mostly firms don't act on it. Yeah. And so what happens is people think, okay, well, we've all, we've all said what the issue is and no mm. one's acting on it. Yeah, I read a report like 80% or 80 odd percent of people think that, yeah, it's got not kind of a waste of time because they're not going to do anything with it anyway. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's the point. We did active listening actually one month and you're right. It's kind of, um, it's being aware of things, but uh, addressing them and, and active listening is where people feel like they're truly heard, don't they? Yeah. Like if you're really listening to them properly and you understand them properly. Um, so a, okay. couple of, a couple of things in the chat. So Lorraine says, I work somewhere with a lot of flexible working patterns, which is amazing, but mm. interestingly, it makes it very hard to have uh, signed office days. Absolutely. So mm. the most critical thing there is that, you know, firstly, thinking about what someone's core team is. And there's many different cultures as there are teams. There's many different cultures as there are leaders, right? You know, so mm. these, um, but what's the core team for different responsibilities? And it might be that, okay, we're going to agree that, it might be one day a month. It might be, you know, a, a focus day once every two months. It might be one day a week, whatever it is, trying to get coordinated time um, with certain teams face to face. And it, it doesn't have to be every week, but there seems to be some strong benefit in in getting recharging that connection with face to face things. And look, you know, the evidence I'm going to give for you that for that is that we all know um, that face-to-face -face events have just got more energy to them. They, they often have more micro interactions that build sort of a sense that we know other people. Um, they're not, they're not, um, they're not absolutely essential, but they do a really big job in building trust. To to your last sort of point there, really. Okay, thank you. I we've got five, just five minutes left. Um... Uh, let's open up the floor. Let's see if we've got any questions from anyone that's come along. Steve, straight up there <laughs> with your virtual hands. Go on, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Bruce. There's so, so much I've written down there, so many nuggets. I really, really appreciate that. The question is, um, as we're on the cusp of another technology revolution with devices like Apple's Vision Pro, which I think is going to further augment and blur the lines between home and work, are you fearful for the future of work or are you hopeful that we as humans will find a way to balance both the needs of people and the opportunity that technology provides? Really difficult one, isn't it? You know, the, the, the thing we're often told, um, that guy, Elon Musk, uh, about three months ago, four months ago, when he was interviewed by Sunak, he said, oh, um, jobs won't be essential pretty soon and you know people will will choose to work or not it begs really interesting questions about how you fund the economy because i i can't see a 
wholesale shift, shift to corporation tax funding the economy and, and funding the universal basic income. So, like, I, I'm not sure how that works. Um, but you know, it, I think the truth is we've. It's very difficult to project ten years down the road to see how our works look, work looks, and and how the components of that are going to change. I know the old adage is that no innovation in technology has ever led to fewer people being employed. But I don't know if you saw the stuff last week from Klarna, which was uh, Klarna is the I think it's a Swedish firm that is the short term loans. And they, they said they've used their online AI bots to replace 750 customer service workers, which is coincidentally the amount of people they made redundant the year before. Um, and it's a really interesting conundrum there, how that is going to displace a lot of a lot of um, semi-skilled skilled work. So I, I don't know about that. Look, broadly, what I do know is that in aggregate data, people who have jobs are happier in life than people who don't have jobs. There seems to be something about some um, responsibility, some purpose with sort of, Mm. A, a gentle purpose there, there seems to be something about that that makes us more fulfilled in life and so you mm. know there's big questions really about how we're going to achieve that and, mm. and how it could all work economically i think yeah thanks bruce thanks. i'm just going to jump in there and say so how, how any tips for people to find their purpose because that was a big thing but it's become it, it's such an ethereal conversation half the time like what practical yeah, I mean, things can people do to actually identify yeah. And it's been so heavily appropriated that quite but broadly what you end up with is that a notion that if you find purpose yourself, it's meaningful. If someone mm -hmm. hands it to you, it tends to feel either like manipulation or like spin. So if, if you turn up at a job and, and the governor says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to announce what our purpose is. Our purpose is this. I'll tell you the specific one I always think of here is that I did some work for a washing paper powder company. And they told, oh, have I frozen? Why did yeah, that you happen? Have. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> I'll switch to, hang on. Hang on. It's like, I'll switch to that. that camera. Okay. Um, I did some work for a washing powder company. And they said, our purpose is to let the children of the world play freely. Get out of here. You're not going, you're not going home to your mom at the weekend. And when she says, what's your new job? And she's, and you say, I am. Um, my purpose is to let the people of the children of the world play free. Get out of here. You're making it personal. Um, and so. Helping I, people I think, smell and look nice. Yeah. But, you know, if you, if you say, oh, my purpose is, uh, you know, I want to pay the mortgage. I want to, I want to save a deposit for a house. Uh, my, you know, purpose can feel very relevant to you individually. But I think sometimes when firms try and tell you what the purpose is, it can feel a bit inauthentic. It's why yeah. someone said to me that the only culture that survives long term is um, is managed irony in the sense that you just pretend you're going along with stuff. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Our purpose is to make the kids of the world play freely. Yeah, it can be a little bit highfalutin, can't it? Um, mm. People can't relate to that. And it's almost too many steps removed. OK, yeah. um, Peyton, you put your hand down. OK, um, OK, we've probably got one question, uh, one uh, time for one last question. So Matt, go for it. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, Bruce. Um, client of mine makes um, AI agents that you can apply. They call them okay. um, synthetic humans that you can apply in the work, the workplace to do various different things. And there we're doing some messaging work for them at the moment. And their sort of stated purpose, if you'll excuse me using that phrase after what you just said, mm -hmm. is to drive everyone towards a three day week. So they see AI as a real uh, optimistic sort of technology in that respect. I've got to be honest, I'm a little bit of a skeptic because I suspect that actually it will just, if anything, increase productivity and make people work the same amount of time. And so I'm trying to play that message out, how that would work to journalists in my head. And I just thought it'd be interesting to get your take on whether you think a three day week is ever a realistic ambition for most people. I, I get lost in a couple of things. Firstly, do we think firms are going to pay you five days work for three days, five days wages for three days work? Because I know that's the promise of the overall scheme. And I'm really intrigued with uh, four, four day week stuff. 
But I think if it comes down to it, I mean, I listen to business people on the news every day. Do I really think if it came down to it, they would willingly incur that? I'm not I'm not fully convinced. Of it. The four day week stuff is, is interesting. Broadly, what you find with four day week experiments, and if most of them say work becomes a bit more intense, work intensity goes up. Um, it means that work becomes a bit more. Uh, you lose a bit of the social stuff. Uh, you can't just instantly switch. You need to reformat how your work plays out. Um, look, you know, uh, um, around election times, it's interesting to look at this. And I guess there's, there's a lot of people when it comes to election times, you know, the reason why the debate about tax cuts is such a big thing. They don't necessarily think societally when they make their decisions. And so who knows, but... Um, I'm sort of, I'm optimistic about the benefits of a four day week, but I'm skeptical about whether business is going to fund us not to work. I guess that would be my economic pessimism, really. Brilliant. Thanks, Bruce. Love that. Okay. On that note, guys, we've just run over. Um, I just want to, to wrap up quickly. Um, Bruce, thank you. Um, thank you very insightful very interesting um i have a whole host of questions we didn't get to ask as is always the case um, bruce um, you mentioned at the beginning some ways that you know you've got your podcast you've got your newsletter anything else you want to say about follow you on linkedin obviously connect we always encourage everyone to connect with the authors anything else you want to say there eat sleep work look, there's, like that there's the uh <laughs> the, there's the url there you'll find my newsletter on there. You'll find podcast on there um okay. yeah that's the main thing really i mean i'm not trying to sell anything you know and uh and the newsletter's free so brilliant okay well look um thank you guys lots of uh interesting insight given us lots to think about um yeah i appreciate your time bruce have a lovely time skiing thank you for coming on maybe we'll be in touch about fortitude to continue the conversation um but yeah guys i hope you've enjoyed it i hope you've taken something useful away from those 45 minutes and uh yeah see you soon thank you very much thank you.